The subject of our lecture this morning is the miracle of the renewed mind. When we pause to reflect on the word miracle, which means many things to many people, we will see if we can come to some common agreement as to what a miracle is from our standpoint this morning. A miracle then, at least as I see it and I hope as you see it, is another name for a natural law fulfilling itself in the way that God intended natural law to act. The idea of a miracle is a human idea. People always say this was miraculous or that was miraculous. But in reality, they are so used to seeing substandard manifestations of imperfection that they do not recognize perfection as normal, but they consider perfection as abnormal. So they say a miracle has happened. And that is my opinion of what a miracle is a wonderful happening that occurs infrequently because humanity do not expect it to happen. I hope then that you will grasp this idea with me as we begin to open up and renew our mind. Now first of all there is a common mind. There is only one mind in the universe and that is first the extension of the mind of God into the Logos and then the extension from the Logos or the Word and we're speaking of the Universal Christ which is another name for the Logos the extension of the Logos out into the world mind so that all things are made by Him and that includes both visible and invisible things they were all created by him as potential. Naturally, individuals uh, making separate use of this common mind set up individualized matrices. And these matrices are the common cause of our world and personal problems. When the matrices are wrong, it does not matter that the frozen energy of the spirit is behind it. The misqualification exists in the individual or in the ordinary world mind and therefore as far as people are concerned the misqualification exists. It doesn't matter that God's in his heaven. All is not right with the world in this case because the world simply is not thinking the way it ought to think. And it becomes very difficult for most of us to understand this because we identify with it. Now one of the reasons why this happens is because of what I have termed stultification. It's sort of uh, like molasses in January. You lack a flow of the pure presence and perfection of the spirit. There is a lethargy inherent within human thought and feeling. This lethargy is very gross, very dense. And it happens in the world because of the lack of flow that the individual puts into his own plug-in into the universal mind. In other words, it comes into our world pure, beautiful, magnetic, and lovely. And when we misqualify it, it becomes a very dense situation. So we must deal with the problem of flow. Flow is the whole key. You have the perfection of God and then you have the principle of flow from the perfection of God. But you see, the problem lies in our density that we pick up from one another. An infection that is easily communicated. You say, well, how do, how do we get this way? It starts out 
in the earliest days of our youth as a baby. Mankind communicates the wrong sense to one another. Don't go near the water, you might drown. You understand what I mean? A mother speaks to her child. She does not speak of confidence in some cases. In other cases, she does. But ideas arise, and these ideas themselves are picked up by the human mind, which is very plastic. It is almost like recording tape. It picks up these ideas, and then it stops the divine ideas or changes them in the individual. After a certain period of time, the young child is pretty well set in so far as his concepts go. And if these are religious concepts, then of course he is dogmatized. If they are simply concepts about the world order, he becomes very much of the opinion that the world order is just so and so. Now actually, individuals get very confused because people have different ideas about the world order. They don't always agree, do they now? People do not always agree in what the world order is. Some people don't even think that there is a God because they can't see him. And they learn this very easily because of the Santa Claus sense, you know, where we come along and tell our children, we say there is a Santa Claus. And then they find out that there isn't any Santa Claus. Now, some children find this out at an earlier age than others. But when it happens, if it happens the wrong way, it shatters our faith in our parents and in our teachers and in society. We have been lied to, and we do not hesitate then to deceive others. I want to point out to you that the world mind is a very complex mind, but it is an outgrowth of the common mind, but through misqualification it builds up its individuality. Now if people started out with the concepts of Eden, the paradise of God, in other words, ideas of perfection from the time they were a little child, if every idea that they ever heard was an idea of perfection, then you see the children's individuality would be individualized perfection. But it is not, because there is no real uniformity guaranteed to anyone. Parents start out, they receive their children fresh from the hand of God, and they have those noble and high aspirations where they're going to teach their children the proper laws. So where do they send them? To Sunday school where the children are thoroughly indoctrinated in conflicting dogmas. These conflicting dogmas later in life will create an impasse because they're going to meet other people who have other ideas in their own and there's going to ensue an argument. These arguments are profitless. They never in God's world produce any perfection. They never do anything particularly good for people and they do plenty of harm. Why? Because the mind of people enjoys, that is the ego enjoys the feeling and satisfaction it gets from being right. People would rather be right than rain. You know what I mean. Even if there's a drought, they want to be right. That's the most important thing for the world mind today is that it be right. Now actually, the world mind is not necessarily right. But somebody's bound to be right somewhere. If you take a host of ideas, put them all together, what happens? Well, some of those ideas are right about some things. And they're wrong about other things. And so you have the constant conflict, the seesaw of ideas that goes on all over the world. Most of these ideas are actually started by the older generation who didn't get the right start to begin with and they passed this on in what we have called tradition. So tradition itself, while it was intended to preserve virtue, also becomes the preserver of vice. 
It's very important that we understand this because we are going to produce a sense here today of a renewed mind. In order to produce a sense of a world mind that is free from the concepts that the world has given to us. Now what I want to do is point out to you what I have called the flow through the prism, the prism of individuality. You have a beam of light and the beam of light is coming down to the triad of the prism. And we always deal with the three colors. We deal with the pink and the blue and the gold that come through the prism. Now with most people, the prism is a prison because once the light comes in, they qualify everything rigidly. In no way do they allow themselves a freedom to focus new ideas. People enjoy so much learning because it always gives them a sense of satisfaction if they can tell someone else how they ought to go, you see, what they ought to think, what they ought to do. This is very important to people to be able to convey to other people that they know what is right. It doesn't always depend uh, on it being right, but just if they have a sense of it being right, do you see? Now, the prism is the part of the mind the emotions and the faith of the individual, what they believe in, what they feel, what they think, so that the common mind that comes forth from God flows through the prism and then individualizes. And here is the whole problem. People do not individualize correctly. They individualize according to habit patterns and traditions that have been handed down from generation to generation. And there's a tremendous aberration in the world. You cannot get away from it. It's here. And how do you tell it? Ask a lawyer, ask a doctor, ask a teacher, an educator. They will all tell you the same thing. That people have different ideas. You see what I mean? Everybody has a different idea, a different concept. Even wives and husbands do not agree, sometimes especially. They have different ideas. Children do not agree with their parents. People do not agree with their teachers sometimes as they get older and begin to think for themselves. They decide that they are right. And this becomes a terrible problem, far worse than you realize. Because it's like being out in a desert and not knowing which way is north and not having a compass on a cloudy day or in the dark of night. You just don't know which way to go, which way to turn. And so you decide that you will go whichever way you want to go. Because after all, that's the best way to go, the way you want to go. And this is often what happens when it comes to matters of individuality. Then you have rationalization, not reason, that takes over. How many of you know what rationalization is? Most of you? Or shall I define it? Well, this again gets right back to that compassless state. People decide that whatever they have in their own head, whatever they believe to be right, whatever they think is right, based upon either education, something they've read in a book, something their mother told them, my mother done told me, you know. In other words, they have some basis of knowledge where someone has communicated this to them, plus they are able to deduce this from their own intelligence. And it seems right unto them. The prophets say, and I'm not talking about ourselves, I'm talking about the old prophets, they say there is a way 
that seemeth right unto a man, and the end thereof is death. So we see that human reason, human rationalization does not always take us safely through. There has to be something greater, something more than that. And what is it? The Bible says, Come, let us reason together now, saith the Lord. Most people don't know the meaning of that. What it means is, come, let us re, R-E dash S-U-N, re-sun, saith the Lord. Now there's a great deal behind that word, re-sun. It dates back to the original perfection of God. I cannot conceive in my wildest imagining that there has not been a purpose and a plan behind the creation from the very beginning. I believe that the intelligence of God is native to creation. I see this in the physical world around me. I see it manifesting in the potential of my own mind or anyone's mind, the potential for good. I see it in the flowers, in the trees. I see it in the mathematical precision of the stars. I see it in the ordination of the seasons. Everywhere we see that there is a vast and sweeping omnipresent intelligence. Therefore, that intelligence, which is a part of the mind of God, goes back to the beginning of creation when man was made in the image of God. Therefore, if man was made in the image of God, that doesn't mean I was made in the image of God and you weren't. It means that all of us were created in the same image. So the principle of resunning or of using reason means the principle of going back to the first cause or the first light. And that is the light of the mind of God. And if science wants to deny this, let them deny it. The giant computer of nature affirms it. As I've often told audiences in different parts of America, if you can take a Swiss watch and knock it apart with a hammer, preserving the pieces, and put them into a paper bag and fly up here 10,000 feet in a helicopter and drop them out, and when they land on the ground they're all made into a nice Swiss watch and still ticking, then I'll tell you that this is proof of the reality of what you think. God has already created that gigantic computer and it works. No one can tell me it doesn't work. I see living people everywhere and their bodies work. They don't always work the way they want to with all the gunk they take in as food and all the violations that they make of the laws of nature, but they work. And we find that uh, the doctors and scientists and people engaged in taking care of the body, they're able many times to make these bodies work better even when something is interfered with them, correct? So we see that the potential for change and for good is inherent within our bodies. All nature conspires to keep a man alive. Even when things occur, such as sudden changes in the blood pressure of a person, why certain things will immediately go into action subconsciously within him so that that body will seek to preserve itself. And this is inherent within the body. You don't have to push an emergency switch that says panic button and start pushing it. Nature does it for you. Sometimes it causes you to faint. Why? Well, you faint because it's nature's way of restoring normality in the body. So I believe that the body is the best barometer and the mind is the best barometer that indicates to us the existence of God. I do not see how anyone can for one moment, one solitary moment, doubt the existence of God when they see the perfection of their own body or nature itself. These things did not occur just through an accident. They occurred through the intelligence of God. And therefore, in order to renew our mind, we have to go back to the first cause. And that means quite a bit. 
It does not mean that we must discount everything that science has learned, everything that we have learned, but it does mean that we ought to put it into perspective and realize that there's something to be said for the invisible mysteries that are not yet solved in our own mind. Let's not just take what we have learned, that little tiny uh, dot on our computer. Let's understand that there's miles and miles of lines that are not yet written on the computer of a man's own individuality. There's still myriad mysteries that are not solved, and we will probably spend the next million years solving them. Let's not worry about that which we don't know. Let's just keep the process of flow, intelligent flow, and re-sun ourselves once again in the native light of God. Not always go back entirely to the textbooks and rely upon them. Not always go back to human opinion. Human opinion, I say today, is a failure. If you don't believe it, look at the very concept of a man finding his way back to God. Well, how does it do it in an organized way? The churches claim that they have the answer, that they can show man how to find God. Do they agree? Obviously they do not. There's too many of them. And they have different concepts, different masters, and there's only one God. There are many masters, and there are many angels, and there are many people, but there's only one common mind, and that is the mind of God. We've got to resun them. We've got to go back to our source. We've got to stop the nonsense of thinking that we know it all. The biggest problem is thinking that we know it all. If we can once get to our mind that we don't know it all, that it isn't all written down anywhere except within us by the fingers of God traced there, we will have made a gigantic step toward understanding the perfection of the law. I want to say to you then, that the densification of human nature has occurred through influences. Stop a moment and think about that. How did mankind become dense and unaware of God? He had the five senses, and you still have them, most of you. You're able to see and hear and feel and touch and taste and smell. What is it then what are these senses? They are windows of the soul that reach out and give you a window on the world. And then what you see, what you hear, what you feel, what you can accept goes inside of you. And if these are banal influences, if you are a child playing on the playground, and you come to a merry-go-round and you want to play on it and some of the other kids say, let's keep John off of here. And so they start pushing you and you say, I want to get on that merry-go-round. And they say, no, you cannot get on it. You then, for the first time, begin to decide that people are not friendly. And you don't understand why these boys or girls will not let you play on this merry-go-round. You feel you're entitled to it just as much as they are, and you form that opinion. The influences of the playground. Then, too, if you're in a home with, with other children, you come to your brother and you say, can I have this or can I look at this that you have? The brother says, no, you can't do it. And you say, well, when can I do it? He says, you can't ever do it. It's mine. And then you begin to develop the sense of possessiveness. You feel right away. That brother of mine possesses that, and I don't. I do not have it. He does. Why won't he give it to me? Even for a moment. I want to play the game too. And so we learn selfishness, and we learn possessiveness, and we learn all kinds of bad ideas right in our own home. And sometimes parents, because they're not patient, will turn around and slap their children because they ask them for something. They'll say to their children, didn't I tell you you couldn't have that and you shouldn't ask me again? Crack. And they slap them across the face. And trauma occurs. And the mind of that child is again aware of human influences. Influences occur all the time. 
You go into an office building to see a lawyer, and he has an acidy secretary. And she said, I'm sorry, he's busy, and snaps at you. And you say, well, when can I have an appointment? He's all booked up the next two weeks, at least, maybe three. But I've got to see some lawyer today. This is an emergency. My son's in jail. Well, I'm sorry. He's too busy to talk to you. Well, couldn't he even give me a couple of minutes so I could get some advice? I'm sorry. No advice. You'll have to leave. You formulate all kinds of opinions of the disservice of people. You go into a filling station. You ask to have your car filled up. You never remember all the nice people that come out as a rule and say, Good morning, how are you? It's a lovely day, isn't it? What can I do for you? No, but let somebody come out and abuse you and right away that goes down deep inside and you decide that the world is a hostile world. And this is what really makes people do these things in the first place. The secretary that was hostile to you had this done to her. And mankind does not live the golden rule. We have a crazy mixed up world because we have the potential of the Christ inside of us. And I'm going to tell you something. In many, many cases, if you look back into the minds of these people, into the emotions of these people, you will find that they are Christians and go to church. Some of the most hostile people are Christians. The guy that comes to the light and he starts gunning his motor and you're sitting alongside of him, you're not looking for a drag race, but you're gunning your motor because maybe it's been a little rough and you want to test it. So you start testing it for a second there and he begins gunning his and he looks daggers at you and come on buddy he says come on he says I'll race you my car will beat your car this is all a sense of vain competition and it is the expenditure of enormous quantities of spiritual energy because spiritual energy gets involved with this there is only one energy in the universe and this stops the renewal of the mind because the mind becomes fastened to bits of idiocy. You see what I mean? It gets involved in emotional hassles all the time. And these emotional hassles weaken the individual. And he feels a sense of frustration and hostility. And no nearness of God. No nearness to the renewed mind. Because he himself is pretty sure that the world is a very terrible place to live in. And after all, he contributes to it but won't admit it. Because everybody else is wrong but him. And this isn't true. This is God's world. And it is a beautiful place if we didn't have any people in it. <laughs> but the people are God in potential. And so what we need is the miracle of the renewed mind. What I'm trying to get across to you is that we have an almost 100% situation of brainwashing occurring in the world. We have a brainwashing of people that tells them and reports to them this is the way the world is when it doesn't have to be that way. You can change this world we have by changing yourself. People say, well, if Joe Blow over here didn't do this, I wouldn't do it either. What a ridiculously weak excuse that is. If we start with ourself, and begin the perfection of our own life and are civil and kind and loving and godly to our fellow men, we begin making a point in the world. A point for which maybe we'll get crucified. I agree. We may find people saying all manner of things against us, falsely for my sake, he says. But this doesn't make any difference if you know in your own heart that you are calling to God and trying your best to live according to the Christ principle. You shouldn't really worry about human opinion. It's a little hard sometimes not to, I will admit. Many times I've been the victim of some of these same situations and anybody that takes the stand, anyone that gets up before the public is going to find it will happen that way. I don't think as a child that I ever thought I would stand before audiences and speak. I really didn't. And I can't say that I always enjoy it, but I try. And I try to do my dharma 
That's a, a Hindu word meaning your duty. I try to do my duty because I realize that there are a lot of people in this world that are doing their duty. The bus driver who is on time. The mailman who comes at the same time every day. The physician and the lawyer and the, the educator and the newspaper worker and the street sweeper, the garbage collector. All these people work by the clock. They get up at a certain time, they hang on the straps, many of them in commute, going long distances in some of the larger cities. And they go home at night tired, and they tumble into bed, and sometimes they sit there and fall asleep in front of television. But they're all, most of them that is, thoroughly brainwashed. And every time a man or a woman gets brainwashed, their world shrinks, and they have less and less sense of the renewed mind because they're getting more and more dense. That's why I think the honeymooners that Jackie Gleason used to show was really so typical, you know, of life today in many areas of the country. The man comes home from work, tired, and he says, What do you got for supper? <laughs> and she says, I haven't got a thing, she says. <laughs> We're going out tonight. <laughs> and the whole thing is that way. I mean, they live in little bits of argumentation and human foolishness. And the same circus goes on day after day until people get so bored and sick of it that every year about 6,000 people jump off of bridges and whatnot just because they're sick and tired of living. And why is this? Because their mind is not renewed by the events that occur in their world. There is no renewal. There's only a renewal of densification, of calcification. You know how your bones, because your bloodstream is not pure, gradually begin to pick up all kinds of mineral deposits. They get all over your bones, and then they begin to ache and creak. Well, that's what happens to people's minds. Their minds this beautiful common mind that flowed forth from God by which he made everything is actually a stultified mind getting more and more dense every day. And there's very little in this world to renew it and I guess that's why a lot of people like to come here because the masters help them to renew their mind. Now I want to talk about the role of transmutation, the role of washing. There is a scripture that I always like very much in the Bible. It says that we must cleanse ourselves by the washing of the water by the word. In other words, by the word of life, by the word of renewal, by the word of consecration, we must wash ourselves and cleanse ourselves. Everybody gets up today in the civilized world and they take a bath, most people do. They wash their teeth. If they have an eye infection, they wash out their eyes, they wash their hair, they wash their feet. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. People are still busy washing. Rub-a-dub-dub. -dub. Everybody's washing. But they're not washing their minds. You see, the same old mind is hanging out inside the skull. And it's dirty laundry. It needs washing. And that's why I want to talk about the washing of the water by the word. Transmutation. The violet flame that you see right over here is one of the best things to wash your mind. When I first started out in this work under the master's direction, I did not know the efficiency of the violet transmuting flame. I am here today to testify for myself that I have seen miracles produced by the use of the violet transmuting flame by the use of decrees, by the use of the Master's dictation, by the writings of the Master's. All of this is calculated material, calculated to counteract the brainwashing of the world, to give you a renewal sense, a sense of renewal. And so the washing of transmutation is important to you whether or not you realize it. And if you realize it, it becomes doubly important because you know very well you're not getting enough of it. You know why people are not getting enough of it? They get up in the morning, they scrub all these 
different parts of their body, except their mind as a rule. And uh, then uh, they sit down, they have a breakfast, and then they go to work. And they don't have much time. They're working till maybe noon, and they rush off to lunch. And then after lunch, they have to get back to work again. And then they work, and then they go home from work, and they say, what's to eat? What are we having to eat now? They eat again, and then they say, now where, where are we going tonight, or what do we do? And they think in terms of constant entertainment, or pleasing themselves by some form of entertainment. I went down to visit a very dear soul in a southern state away from here one time and while I don't think much of myself as a person who says, well, I love myself, I try to dedicate myself to help people. At the same time, I know that I could have helped this man and he's a nice man and I went down there and he said, well, he said, why don't you... Uh, Go over there and get this job you want to do done and then come back here and I'll take you to lunch. I said, okay. So I come back and he says, well, some friends just dropped in and we're playing dominoes. And so uh, he said, why don't you go to dinner alone, he said. So I said, all right. So I went to dinner alone. I came back about 9.30. It was rather late at the time. And they were still playing dominoes. And so I said, well, as long as you're going to play dominoes, I may as well go to bed. He said, yeah, why don't you? <laughs> and so this actually happened. And uh, here uh, I probably see this man once in two or three years. But you see, it was more important to play dominoes than it was to discuss the Ascended Master Law or take advantage of my being right there where he could get the material, fresh from the horse's mouth. But it reminded me of a woman who came all the way across the United States to see me and consult with me. She came and she was ready to pay almost any price. Well, I don't charge. So, of course, it was free and I suppose that belittled it a little. But anyway, she wanted to consult with me and so I said, I'll give you a half hour and that's all I can spare. So she sat down with me and I never opened my mouth again until I said goodbye. <laughs> Another idea that a person can plainly see that people are so busy many times with their own opinions that they never have a chance to hear what the masters or what God has revealed on a subject. So the washing of the water by the word is very important. Now I want to mention the mind of Christ and the God planes as being always active. Think about this for a moment now. Here you have a creative act that as far as we are concerned may have occurred millions of years ago or billions of years ago and it makes little difference. But that act that occurred is continuously going on and going on today. It has not stopped. The act of creation continues. And there is a web of life that permeates the universe, our physical body, our mingled minds and all space everywhere. This we may term the Antakarana or the web of consciousness. This penetration of the mind of God and the fact that the events that took place with the first act of creation are still actively going on should prove to us that there has been no change whatsoever in the creative intent or purposes of God. These purposes are just as firm and secure today as they ever were. And if the law didn't function properly, the universe would roll up like a scroll and there wouldn't be any place to go. Brother, I mean that. There wouldn't be any place to go if there was not a sustaining momentum of cosmic Christ and God service in this universe if there was not a continuation of the sun that always rises, of the stars that always twinkle, of the heart that as long as you live continues to beat, there is a constancy of service in this universe for which we ought to be most grateful and thankful. And that is truly in the Antikorana. So, seeing this exists, is it not a catalyst to help release the power of the renewed mind, I say that it is. 
and I say it based upon my own experiences. I have found whenever I get the idea that I am a part of all this mass hysteria and mania that goes on in the workaday world today, that I find refuge in the divine silences that speak louder than all the words of humanity put together because they speak of the perfection of God and the renewal of the perfection of God in myself as well as everyone else. The miracle of the renewed mind then is something that you can produce in your own consciousness. But I'm going to tell you today and straight from the shoulder, it will never happen if you keep on feasting at the feeding troughs of the pigs in the marketplaces. If you're going to go out there and fill yourself with human garbage and human concepts and eat that swill, I can assure you that there'll be no change. Let's define this a minute a little more. From a physical standpoint, you've got to try to eat right. And most of the food in the restaurants today that is being served to people is not right food. It is devitalized, beaten up, it has pulled out of it the essential vitamins and minerals, and then it has added to it some of the most deadly drugs in the history of man, which will produce all kinds of physical problems for people. Speaking honestly, the pollutions of the world are beyond belief, and people are the victims. That's physical. Now let's take the mental pollutions that plague us. You have mental pollutions coming to you through the newspaper, through the magazines, through pornography, through moving pictures, through bad music. You have it everywhere. And this pollutes the mind and the emotions of man. And you have pollutions in the marketplace that involve the feeling world too. All this we were talking about before, of people getting upset over nothing. I went into a restaurant in Philadelphia and there was a young girl standing there, the victim of all of this. This girl was about 19 years of age, and she was serving to us uh, coffee. Her job was to stand at the end of the serving line and ask whether people wanted a pot or a cup. And so she stood there, and she held out the pot and the cup, and she says, pot, 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 pot. And that's the way she was going. And I am not exaggerating. The girl had reached the point where her mind could not grasp what was happening. All she was saying was pot, 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 pot as the people went merrily by. That actually happened. A lot of people without realizing it get in silly habits where they're not really thinking at all. They're not renewing their mind and they're not renewing it in God. They're renewing it in the same old swill and garbage that has trapped them in the first place. They have to get out of this way of thinking. They have to create the miracle and realize it's already created for them and they can tune in on it. You can tune in on the divine miracle. It happened billions or trillions of years ago, but it's still happening today. And while we are sitting in this room here, it's happening right now. So why not develop the idea of attunement with that renewed mind of God? Let's renew our mind. Let's have the miracle of the renewed mind. And what does the renewed mind give? It gives hope. Hope that we're not going to live in that old consciousness any longer. We're going to have the faith that moves mountains. If you're physically sick, you're going to be able to generate the energy that will get you well. If you're in a suicide frame of mind, you're going to develop the faith and the hope that God can give you something of worth in your world and that you can use it for the benefit of your fellow men. You're going to develop a sense of worth you never had before. Why? Because you have a renewed mind. If you don't have it, you might sit there and say, what do I do next? What am I going to do now? Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll go down and have me a beer. Well, I don't say. I'm not one of these people. Uh, I was over in Germany with uh, Dr. Isaac. We were on a tour over there in 1968. And I sampled German beer while I was there. I don't say that a glass of beer is going to make you a saint or a sinner. I don't drink it. I don't drink beer. I don't run around drinking. I never go into taverns. But I did try a German beer. And I tried a glass of Italian wine. But the point is 
that you have to understand that it's not what a man eats or drinks in a physical sense necessarily that actually pollutes his mind. What pollutes his mind is his own vile thoughts if he allows himself to get into that state. We have to learn to dump our bad thoughts, get rid of them. Jesus Christ said, Get thee behind me, Satan. And we have to learn to do it too. And you can do it. Because there's very few people today that are not either tempted to think in mediocrity or they think bad thoughts. Some people say, well, me, I don't think bad thoughts. I admit once in a while I get depressed. That's enough, brother. Right there. <laughs> I mean, getting depressed itself can be a bad thought as far as you're concerned. You don't have to be black. You can be just a little gray. You know what I mean? We have to learn to get rid of those things, have the renewed mind all the time, 24 hours a day. A lot of people are very happy to have a fresh mind except when they start going to sleep. And somehow or other they think they can sit there or lay there on their bed and have reveries that are fantasies. And no matter what they think, even if it's not good, they seem to excuse themselves because they say, well, I had this while I was going to sleep. Ridiculous. You are 24 hours a day a son of God. And 24 hours a day you might as well try to hold clarity of mind, be clear in your thinking, think good thoughts, and watch how it will pay off. It's not going to pay off if you don't work at it. People just seem to feel that because there exists a law of gravity, they're going to be a steel ball up on the top of a hill, and then they'll excuse their conduct of rolling downhill by saying, well, gravity pulled me. Well, an intelligent steely has got brakes, and it goes halfway downhill, and then it says, I'm going up. And it's a lot harder to go up than it is to go down, I admit. But everybody can be intelligent. And they all have the power, if they want it, to renew their mind. So let's decide we want it. That's the first step in doing it. If you say to me today, I don't want to renew my mind, please put your hand up. Anybody that doesn't want to renew their mind, put it up. I don't see any hands, so I assume we all want it. All right. If we want it, that's the first step to getting it. Desire. You've got to desire to have a renewed mind. This has to also include the admission of guilt on your part that you realize that you can have a more renewed mind in the future than what you have today. In other words, you're a little bit short of the mark. I feel that I've been short of the mark even though I'm marked. <laughs> I'm sure that everything is relative. It's like one fellow said to me one time, of course he went haywire afterward, but he said to me, he said, well, he said, if, if you're so good, he says, why are you still here? So I was really stuck on that one, you know, and along came the Master Mori and he said, tell him, he says, that God doesn't skim off all the cream. <laughs> so we have to recognize that all things are relative. You may not be the sun in all of his shining strength, but you can be a pretty big electric light bulb. And eventually, you can reach the point where you're an arc light. And then after a while, you decide you're going to be a little sun, and then a bigger sun, and a bigger sun, and keep on growing in spiritual maturity. I want to say that the renewal process is a total one. This means that each person has to decide on total renewal. There's no halfway measures about this. If you're going to neglect your body, you're going to neglect your mind. If you're going to neglect your mind, you're neglecting your body. It may be a little difficult sometime to get out here and do your calisthenics or do your morning walks or whatever you do for exercise, but it is important if you're able to move at all to keep mobility, to keep mobile. And so everybody should try their best to achieve a process of renewal. And this does not happen automatically, of that I can guarantee you. If there's something wrong with you, get it fixed if you can. I can remember 
my mother was very, bless her memory and bless her heart, afraid of any kind of an operation. And so she had on her head what's known as a sebaceous tumor or a wen underneath her hair, which she used to cover with a pug. And that thing grew from the size of an acorn to almost the size of an oak. And finally one day she bumped it and knocked it off. I guess nature took care of it for her. Well, somehow or other she trained me to have a little fear when I was a boy about having things done like that. And then I had a little sweat gland on my neck that had a little thing in it that the doctor could have slit and popped out with his fingers in just about a second. But no, I didn't want to have it done. I was afraid to monkey with it many years ago. So I kept it. And it kept abusing me. Finally it got so I couldn't even sleep on it anymore. And it was the size of a crab apple. And then one day I went to the hospital and I had it removed and I wondered why I didn't have it removed when it was a little pee, you see. And that's the way it is with a lot of little physical things that plague people. If you have something wrong with yourself, for heaven's sakes, in the name of a renewed mind, go and get it fixed. Whatever it is, don't be afraid. I mean, uh, you can't be any worse off, can you? Whatever you have, get it fixed. Mentally, if you have problems with your mind sometimes when you feel depressed, get that fixed too by developing more faith, the miracle of a renewed mind. All the way through life, spiritually, determine you're going to have total renewal. Don't be satisfied to drag around half dead. Come alive. And you can come alive sometimes just by a change in diet. Sometimes your food will do it for you. Or if you haven't been saying your morning prayers as faithfully as you ought to, ask yourself if you're being fair with God and giving Him an opportunity to work for you. Ask and ye shall receive. Go ahead and neglect the asking. And watch what happens to you. If you don't ask God, I can promise you that by cosmic law he gave you free will. He's not going to do anything to change life for you unless you will it so. So will it so and make it known by prayer or communication. Sometimes God is very merciful. He sees you have so much desire for a certain thing to happen, he just makes it happen even when you don't ask him. But that's not a violation of his own law because by your great desire for it, you have actually brought it into manifestation. Some people are masochistic. And this is absolutely true. They enjoy having something to create sympathy in the minds of others. This is an abomination to yourself as well as other people. What you should do is make your mind up that you're going to have a renewed being. And your own mind can actually make you well. It can heal because it is the mind of God. Sometimes people think they have to go through a tremendous uh, logarithmic process whereby they sit down and almost need a calculator or a computer to take care of it for them. This is not so. I can guarantee you that I have literally raised the dead by simply one little tiny process, the desire to do it. Sometimes the childlike way is the key. I remember, and I know this to be true, in fact, sitting in this room here is a man, in fact, there's two men here, one is Mr. Ben Frank right over here who was literally crushed and was practically in the process of dying in the hospital at Tulsa, Oklahoma. When word was passed to me that this had happened, I did a lot for Mr. Frank, but it wasn't me that did it, it was God. But I only asked God once. I said, that man must not die. I said, I want that man healed and I know you're going to do it now. And I had full faith when I made that one call that I didn't have to ask God a thousand times to do it and say, Oh God, please heal Ben Frank. Just once I asked and I knew. And then I was told by the Spirit to go down there to Tulsa and place my hand upon him. And the man is here today who was crushed. And here he is. And there's another man, Mr. Lancaster, who was having a great issue which caused him great grief. And I made the call for him. I said, George Lancaster must not, I said, pass on. He's got to live, and I demand that you make his body right. I did not again spend hours and hours in prayer because I believe that if I ask God once, he does it. 
And that is one of the great problems that people have in renewing their mind, is they do not renew their faith. They do not understand that you do not have to struggle with God. If you have to struggle, something is wrong with you. What you have to do is have enough faith to believe that God hears you. And he hears you the first time or he doesn't hear you at all. The Jews had a wailing wall and they used to walk up and down and wail by the hour. When you know the living God, you do not have to wail. You ask him once. If he doesn't do it, it probably isn't his will at all. But at the same time, I believe that the miracle of faith dwells in the renewed mind. And that miracle is the miracle of action. It's the action of you and you and you, of everyone. You can help others and you can perform absolute miracles. But some people say, well, how do you do it? And they want me to write a book telling just how I do it. All I know is that we get results by asking. We receive. But you must ask in faith and you must renew your mind. Now I will admit to you that just as Jesus Christ and St. Augustine and all kinds of good people through the ages have been plagued by all kinds of negative thoughts that have sought to crush them, that does not mean that the existence of the negative thoughts is of necessity a deterrent to the positive thoughts working because the positive thoughts will work right along when the negative thoughts exist. For example, we were discussing one day why we didn't have more people locally, although we're growing locally. We just about fill this room and part of that room locally on Sunday nights now. And I said, well, I wonder why we're not growing more locally. And my wife said, I know the answer. She said the answer lies in this one fact. She said that wherever there is great light, there is always great darkness camping alongside of it. And she said that the moment you have great light, you are going to see that the enemy is also drawn to counteract that light. And so that is the problem because the darkness will come where the light is. You have to understand this. But we must not fear the darkness because the light is stronger and the light will ultimately grow and your mind will grow, but you've got to give yourself time. The real problem lies in time. People get the idea it's got to happen right now. Yes, the process does have to happen right now. You've all said you want to renew your mind. All right, make up your mind that it's going to happen from today forward. And even this noon, wherever you go, as you start walking, put a bounce into your step. When you start walking, say, God is walking through me. God is thinking through me. I'm renewing my mind in that first pristine, pure mind of the living God. You have just as much chance as Jesus Christ, that blessed soul, or any of the masters. And I'm going to tell you something. You'll make God awfully happy if you start doing it. Because people have the silly idea, they say, I'm not good enough. Well, you may not be good enough, but God is in you and God in you is good enough. You see the point? That is the miracle of the renewed mind. The miracle that you can perform today and every day as long as you live. And it will make a difference. Thank you and God bless you.